good evening to all of us. So we have Vladimir with us today. Before I go into the introduction, we will start with a minute of silence. Then proceed. Welcome back. Um, so today we have uh, Vladimir with us. Uh, we are privileged to have these two hours along with him. Uh, Vladimir has been associated with IPI for a very long time, probably since the beginning and Divya might know even better. Um, he's a Sanskrit scholar and uh, very passionate about uh, Vedanta. Uh, Vedantic studies and uh, uh, Sanskrit as such. Um, and then he, you will see that uh, when he speaks. And uh, he is right now uh, associated with Lagres Center as a director in research studies of integral philosophy. Um, so today he will be taking us through or discussing. To, uh, Rig Veda, which is very close to his heart, with maybe I think it was his thesis as well. And uh, uh, it's always a privilege and such a grace to hear him out speak about uh, uh, Rig Veda. So, thank you, Vladimir, to uh, accept our to join us here. And uh, we are looking forward to your the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Prashant. Thank you, IPI, for kind of keeping up with me for so long. From from 2006, we had uh, our sessions, regular uh, weekly sessions, by the way, studies of the Rig Veda, you remember, and Upanishads, and um, it was the golden time of my life, so to say. <laughs> and then things happened and I had to travel and now I landed up in US. <clears throat> uh, but uh, yes, uh, this is a, a dear to my heart topic of the Rig Veda and the Rig Vedic studies. And we continue also. We have many courses online at Lagras. You may check our lagrascenter.com and see what courses we offer. Um, and um, right, so I prepared kind of an overview for the psychologists and philosophers of um, Indian uh, philosophy and yoga. So I do not know your interest because I do not know you, all of you. <clears throat> so, but I will be speaking to the psychologists and those interested in this Vedic uh, vision. <clears throat> we cannot call it philosophy because it is both philosophy and psychology. They are not yet split. You know? Everything which is philosophical in the Veda is also deeply psychological and spiritual. So. As you know, Rig Veda is the oldest book available to us. Uh, uh, Tilak uh, dates it approximately 6000 BC. 
even earlier because Taittiriya Samhita was dated 6000 BC according to him, according to his findings in Taittiriya Samhita. So Rigveda must be much uh, uh, older than the Taittiriya. Uh, of course, uh, Western scholars uh, give different dates, uh, starting from 4500 Gonda BC and so on, until 2500 BC. But uh, nobody knows the timing and the topics in the Rig Veda are timeless, so to say. So mm, what, what does it really matter when it was uh, received, revealed? Yes, it may be revealed today and it will be still the timeless topic. So uh, the compositions are very different. There are 10 mandalas, as you know, in the Rig Veda, 10 books. And uh, each book has a collection of hymns to the different deities, to the different uh, powers of higher consciousness, of the divine consciousness. Um, Rig Veda is beautiful in one way that it is, it is not explaining anything. It's not a philosophy. It's rather an action, direct communication with these forces. Yeah, they are constant invocation, constant appeal to the force. And you can, when you read these hymns, you can feel the presence of this power. The purpose of these hymns was to create that connection, that contact with the force and allow it to work upon our own consciousness. So it is direct in nature. It's it's not really a philosophy. It doesn't say anything. It doesn't explain things in the third person. Yeah? It is in the first person inquiry method, constantly. Yes. Uh, and appeal is very interesting. Uh, appeal is not I, but we come to us. Yes. Mm, bring us force, change us, uh, help us, fight for us. Yes. Uh, and so on. Always you, second person, whoever is the deity. Uh, of course, the, the most popular deities are Indra and Agni. There are more than 250 hymns dedicated to Indra and uh, next Agni on the list, and then all the rest. Marut, Sashvins, Varuna Mitra, uh, and so Vishnu, Rudra. By the way, to Vishnu and Rudra, there are less hymns than to uh, Indra and Agni. And somewhere Sri says that it doesn't matter because, truly speaking, Vishnu and Rudra is very difficult to invoke. These are the fundamental deities, but their activities, actions are Agni and Indra. Yes? So Agni is the son of Rudra. So everything which is kind of when we invoke Agni, we invoke the action of Rudra, of Shiva. Whereas uh, when we invoke Indra, this will be the lightning from above by supported by Vishnu. So, so in a way, Vishnu and Rudra are acting upon us from these two great deities, which are most invoked in the Veda. Um, so I prepared some kind of presentation to give you an outline. And from there, we start discussing if you want. Shall I do this? Yeah. OK. Um, I think this is it. OK, so here is the chronology, which I already mentioned, of Indian literature. Some Hita texts are uh, dated by different scholars differently. Um, and um, then we have the literature of Brahmanas, which is um, more of the commentary on the Samhitas and uh, ritualistic application of the mantras. So if Samhitas are direct actions, direct invocations to the deities, then Brahmanas would be application of these 
mantras to the ritual, everyday uh, ritualistic actions. Uh, and also mythological um, explanations, stories. Brahmanas actually begin this tradition of the stories of Purana. So yeah, in Brahmanas we find all original stories which later are developed in Puranas and Mahabharata and Ramayana. So, so uh, then there is a period of Aranyakas. So this gap, there was a big gap though, I don't show here this gap between Samhita period and Brahmanas. Sri says Brahmanas was a new attempt to capture that knowledge of the Vedic Rishis in ritualistic way. And then uh, there was uh, Aranyakas follow Brahmanas closely, and then there was a new attempt to create uh, this grand knowledge of the Veda, was uh, the Upanishads. And the Upanishads approached the Vedic knowledge in their own way. There was already a shift in in uh, the language, in the approach to knowledge, it became closer to us, to our mental structure of consciousness. So it has already all the elements of the intuitive and uh, rational explanation. It's closer to the philosophy. So Upanishads are more philosophy uh, and Samhitas are more the hymns, invocations. Yeah. And then we have pure philosophical treatises, Sankhya and Yoga. Um, the oldest Sankhya is approximately 800 BC. We find it also in the Gita. Uh, Gita is also part of the Upanishads. So until Upanishads in, in, and Gita plus, these four first are Shruti, the rest are Smriti tradition. Yeah? Sankhya and Yoga, Itihasas, Puranas, Tantras, and Darshanas, all the Darshanas, as you know. Six Darshanas. Um, so this chronology most probably you know very well. There is nothing new here. So what, if we come to the oldest vision, the Grand Veda, which was the foundation of all Indian tradition. By the way, I must say here that actually all of these Brahmana, Saranyaka, Upanishads, Sankhya, Yoga, Puranas, Darshanas, they are all referring to the Veda. We should know that, to the Samhitas, to the Rishis of Samhitas. So they are actually mm, commentaries on the commentaries on the commentaries and so on. Yeah? Kind of uh, basically, we have only originally the Vedic text, which is being so extensively commented and developed, which built the whole Indian tradition. Even Buddhism, if you take, and Jainism, uh, even Buddhism, which is kind of fighting with the Veda, <laughs> with Brahmanism, because Brahman has created so-called Brahmanism, yeah? ritualistic explanation of the of the Vedic knowledge. Shirobindo also puts it into the framework of uh, of the uh, stages or ages. Yes, so the symbolic age the typal age, the conventional age, and finally the individualist or the uh, individualist age, and finally the subjective age. So we, we are moving from the, the symbolic age of Samhitas uh, through the typal age of Brahmanas and conventional also kind of Brahmana, Saranyaka, Upanishads, and uh, Sankhya and Yoga. And finally, we arrive at individualist age, Kali Yuga. We can speak in terms of Yuga, Satya Yuga, and yes, uh, uh, Treta, Dvapara, and finally Kali Yuga. Kali Yuga is the most individualistic approach to knowledge. So there is narrowing down from the most grand vision where we are all we and we all invoke the higher powers for transformation of our nature towards the more and more individualistic approach. And here in Upanishads, we will see this shift, drift towards the faculties of consciousness, 
where there are no devatas invoked anymore, but uh, the gods are referred to as the faculties of consciousness, as seeing, hearing, speaking, thinking, breathing, and being in the body. Yes? Annam pranam chakshu srotram manovacham. It is definition of the Taitiriya, six major faculties. They are the devatas. The devatas of the ancient period, they are changed into the faculties of individual consciousness. This narrowing down towards individual and dealing with individual and the very mukti, concept of mukti, liberation of the individual, appears approximately in this time of Upanishads and Aranyakas. Uh, we do not have the concept of mukti in the Rigveda at all because there is nothing to be a kind of free from. The whole idea was very different. The idea was to bring the higher consciousness into the manifestation and transform and change the manifestation. And this was the idea known to us as yajna, as the sacrifice. So the sacrifice <clears throat> is uh, making sacred our life, our profane life, made sacred by the forces of higher consciousness. And this was done by the Vedic Rishis. They were constantly transforming our being, our nature, our personal and our social life. And then it became quite difficult to continue because the humanity was not ready. And there was a split, as Shirbindo says, and the part uh, of uh, it stayed in India and the other half went into the West and known as Chaldean or Semitic tradition, where the preference was put on to the powers of nature. And in India, there was a preference kind of uh, on the powers of the spirit. So spiritual presence was more um, important for Indian tradition and for the Chaldean, for Semitic, the manipulation and <clears throat> managing the powers of nature became more important, which later turned into uh, alchemy and finally to the science and the whole materialism of the West is based on this uh, manipulations of powers of nature. Whereas uh, in India it became Advaitic more and more when nature was neglected and spiritual uh, Advaita Vedanta came into being and Buddhism and all other forms, Jainism, where uh, this world became a Maya, some kind of illusion you have to get rid of and dissolve yourself in Brahman or Nirvana and never be reborn again. So this was the idea for India, and that was just the opposite idea for the West. They kind of split into two different halves. But in the Samhita, they are one and the same in the Rig Veda. There is no split. There is a spirit charging, or the nature is being charged by the spirit. The very manifestation is seen as the enterprise of the spirit. Everything is spiritual in nature. But later, it's not like this. Nature becomes Maya. Spirit is real. <clears throat> Brahma, Satyam, Jagan, Mithya. And on the other side, just the opposite. Spirit fades away and nature uh, becomes more and more prominent. <clears throat> I hope it's quite obvious to you. So basically, integral yoga is to bring them back as it was in, in the times of the Veda. So bring these two back. Uh, and that's why we have Sri Aurobindo and the mother. Mother represents the Chaldean, the occultistic tradition of the West, of the Semitic tradition, and Sri Aurobindo, the Vedic tradition. So they, when they come back and again join the um, <coughs> split elements, so then we have the integral yoga. It's quite amazing to think. If you look at Sri Aurobindo's symbol, we will come to it again. 
uh, you will see these two elements, the six cornered star. Somewhere I have it. Here I have it. I will come to it. You see this? Six cornered star is the symbol of the Chaldean tradition, and this lotus with seven waters within is the avatar, the idea of the Vedic tradition. Vedic and Semitic tradition coming back in one sign joining back their parties. OK, I come back to uh, to the idea of the what the Rig Veda was about. Oh, sorry, I just jumped so much misleading you. So the Vedic paradigm, what was this paradigm? What was the knowledge of the Vedic times? The faculties of consciousness in the Veda are seen as projected from the Divine Mother Aditi, infinite consciousness force. The supreme emanations of that consciousness force are called Adityas, or sons of Aditi, or faculties of Aditi. There are seven of them, Varuna, Mitra, Aryaman, Bhaga, Daksha, Amsha, and Surya. Most probably heard these names. These are very ancient godheads. Yeah. So these seven Adityas, seven sons, um, they are constantly with Aditi, with uh, their mother. Uh, and there was the eighth son born, who was called Vivasvat or Vivaswan, as you know, the, the Lord of the Sun. Literally, Vivasvat is the one who is shining vast, Vivas. Vas is to shine V in all directions. But he was born as Martanda, there is another name, as dead embryo. He was born ugly, without limbs, uh, so to say. And when Aditi saw him, she left him to be alone. With her seven sons, she left him. This is a story in Puranas, you can find it. And so he was left alone. In other stories, he was taken by the uh, darker forces and was hidden in the subconscious cave or inconscient being a level of consciousness so in the darkness he was hidden so the sun was stolen and put into the darkness somewhere below by the demons so from there and that is another way of saying that it was ugly without limbs was left alone there was separation of light of the transcendental light uh, in Vivasvat. So Vivasvat is another source of light within the darkness. In the Vedas, it is said that the Agni is rising from Vivasvat. Agni is rising from the Lord of the Sun. It's kind of unusual because the Sun is above, so Agni cannot rise from him, yeah? cannot come up. But that means that Vivasvat is below. The sun is hidden below. And this Vivasvat and the hidden sun below is the very secret of the Veda. It, the secret is that when we go into the deepest darkness, in the, at the bottom of the darkness, uh, and the very core of the darkness, we will find the supreme light. What is also important here to see that each of this hierarchy, each of these the avatars uh, are put in a particular order. So we see Varuna is first. <clears throat> Without uh, Varuna, there will be no Mitra. Yeah? Uh, Mitra is second, Aryaman is third. This is important, yes, the order. So each of these devatas or Adityas, um, is um, embodying the previous one. So Mitra embodies Varuna, Aryaman, Varuna, and Mitra, Bhaga, Varuna, Mitra, Aryaman. So without Varuna, Mitra, Aryaman, there is no Bhaga. So Surya, in a way, embodies all six Adityas and is representative of all of them. 
in his own being. There are seven discs of the sun, and these are the discs behind. And the Vivasvat as the eighth sun embodies all seven. This is also important to understand. So according to Sri Aurobindo, the first four, which are here, these four and then three, uh, he calls them the, mm, the guardians of light, the transcendental godheads. Varuna represents vastness of infinite being, Sat. Mitra, the luminosity and harmony of consciousness, Chit. Aryaman, the power of the divine tapas. Bhaga, the bliss of the divine fulfillment. Ananda. So you can see Sat, Chit, Tapas, Ananda in the Vedic language. Yeah? So they are not called Sat, Chit, Tapas, Ananda. It is in the later Hinduism we find these definitions in Tantra and, and also in the starting from the Upanishads we find these definitions. But in the Veda, these are the personalized godheads. These are persons, Varuna Mitra, Varuna from root Vri to cover everything, to hold within oneself, embrace everything, this vastness and purity and infinity of the divine being. Mitra is this from root Ma to measure because consciousness is measuring out the vastness of the divine existence and gives it a kind of specific uh, attention to one particular aspect of the divine being and in this way by measuring out creates shapes it aryaman is the power which is the result of that application of consciousness and that creates the being in a particular form and bhaga is the emanation of the divine bliss from this action of being conscious of the a divine being. So basically to be conscious of oneself is the bliss. You know? That's what it means in the psychological terms. And then there are three more. These devatas, Dakshamsha and Surya, they are put on their other level. And these represent the triple supermind in Sri Aurobindo's language. The triple supermind is unity, the highest level of the supermind, of Vijnana. Um, and then many in one, and one in many, in many. This kind of division from unity to diversity. So, and these three goddesses of the supermind, these are the words of Sri Aurobindo. Daksha represents the power of thought, capital T, all discerning and all distributing power of supramental consciousness. Amsha represents the diversity in oneness, supported by the unifying power of Daksha. You know, Amsha is the portion. So portion implies the the to be part of something bigger, of some oneness, and to be separate from that oneness. Both. Yeah. Surya Savitar or Surya Savitri, as Shyabinna calls it, <clears throat> represents all the seven adityas. I already mentioned this. And his rays represent the diversity in the domain of Svar. We will come to Svar. It's a very important concept and discovery by Sri Aurobindo. He calls it over mental consciousness. The realm of the rays of the sun, not the realm of the sun, not his body, but his rays. Uh, so if you summarize the whole thing, the whole vision of seven adityas, it will be Varuna Sat, Mitra Chit, Aryaman Tapas, Bhaga Ananda, and Daksha Supramental Knowledge Force, Amsha Supramental Many in One and One in Many, and Surya Savitri Supramental Manifestation. So these three are Vijnana, yes? This Sat, Chit, Tapas, Ananda, or Sat, Chit, Ananda, and Vijnana of the uh, Upanishads, of the Taitiriya Upanishad. Hmm? 
So these seven are projected into the lower hemisphere and create lower seven worlds. And Aditi has a sister, a DT, yeah, twin sister. If Aditi is undivided, infinite consciousness power, then DT is dividing consciousness power, the mother of darkness, so to say. This is mother of light, it's mother of darkness. There are two mothers, and by these two mothers, everything is being created. Mother of manifestation, of separation in time and space. So all of these great godheads have the whole huge domain cover everything. Varuna from the divine being to the material existence. Matter is that lowest level of the divine existence. Yeah? Uh, Mitra, Aryaman, they turn this consciousness force into the life force. It's interesting because life force is double in nature. We will look into it if we will have time. So Bhaga, uh, according to Upanishads, will represent the mind. Sri changes the scheme. He says it will be the psychic presence. And this will be the overmental creation, which will project the mind, triple mind. We will look into it in a minute. Maybe I will skip this. I do not, don't want to overload you with all these. Or maybe not. Let us uh, take it um, because this is again about the seven worlds. Maybe we'll come to it later. So here they are. I just want to simplify, don't want to overload. So Brahman is Sat, Chit, Ananda, or Chit, Tapas, Ananda, because Chit is always power at the same time. Vijnana, Supermind, which connects this triple higher and triple lower, mind, life, and matter. And you can see that the matter is the lowest and existence is the highest. They are basically... Uh, projection, yes, the highest existence is projected into the lowest being in material existence. So this kind of triplicity that that uh, six-cornered star with Vijnana in between again coming here, you can see these three transcendental worlds and three kind of um, inbuilt worlds, so the lower hemisphere they are crossing, and they are crossed by something square in between, and that is what we call Vijnana, or the supermind. And within the supermind, there is an avatar. So that will give you a very good uh, idea of what Sri Aurobindo's symbol is about. And what is Vijnana? Why the supermind was so important for Sri Aurobindo's yoga? Um, because it combines both the transcendental and this existence. It is on Vijnana level that the, the worlds are being created. Vijnana miyajnam tanute karmani tanute vicha says Taitiriya. Vijnana sacrifice is spreading. Vijnana is spreading the sacrifice. Vijnana creates all the activities. So everything is being shaped in Vijnana. Vijnana deva sarve brahma jyeshtham upasate. And Vijnana, the, all the gods worship as Brahman. So, <clears throat> This is this which manifests the transcendental existence, consciousness, bliss in the forms of mind, life, and matter. And also Brahman is this uh, existence, consciousness, bliss, and Atman is the existent, conscious, blissful, yeah, and so on. So it is the self-aware Brahman. So, and we speak about Atman in terms of Purusha, because Purusha was made by the self 
the formation for manifestation in time and space. Purusha is the person, yeah, personality. So there is Sat Purusha or awareness of one's own divine self or being. There is all conscious soul, there is all blissful soul, there is great soul, that's how Shirobindo names this. Mental being, vital being, and physical being. I'm sure you are aware of these things, yes? This is a known language to many of you who study Sri Aurobindo and Indian tradition. <clears throat> so now I can come to this text, which explains it very well. Atman, that self, represents itself differently in the sevenfold movement of nature according to the domain, oh sorry, dominant principle of consciousness in the individual being. This is important because Atman is self-awareness and it is always about the self, about uh, individual, you know, person. <clears throat> In the physical consciousness, Atman becomes the material being, Annamaya Purusha, literally Purusha made of matter. So my body is Annamaya Purusha. Uh, in the vital or nervous consciousness, Atman becomes the vital or dynamic being, Pranamaya Purusha. In the mental consciousness, Atman becomes the mental being, Manomaya Purusha. In the supra-intellectual consciousness dominated by the truth or causal idea called in the Veda Satyam Ritam Brihad, the true, the right, the past, Atman becomes the ideal being or great soul, Vijnana Maya Purusha, or Mahatatman. In the consciousness proper to the universal beatitude, Atman becomes the all blissful being or all enjoying and all productive soul, Ananda Maya Purusha. It's interesting that he adds this all productive soul because in Puranas it is called Janarloka, the, the generation where the creation is taking place, all enjoying and all productive soul. Uh, from this source, uh, our souls are born. Yes, from Ananda Maya Purusha. Interestingly, that uh, in all of these five, he says Atman becomes, notice, yeah? Atman becomes the all blissful, Atman becomes the ideal, Atman becomes the mental. And now notice, in the consciousness proper to the infinite self, awareness, which is also infinite, all effective will, chittapas, Atman is the all-conscious soul. He, he doesn't become anymore. There is no more becoming there. There's only being. In the conscious, yes, all-conscious soul, and that is the source and Lord of the universe, Chaitanya Purusha. In the consciousness proper to the state of pure divine existence, Atman is, is Sat Purusha the pure divine self, man being one in his true self with the Lord who inhabits all forms can live in any of these states of the self in the world and partake of its experiences. He can be anything he wills from the material to the all blissful being and through the Ananda Maya he can enter into the Chaitanya and Satvarusha. So first we have to totally realize ourselves as souls and then we may even experience the divine consciousness and being. Now these are these what we were looking into. If you look at them a bit differently we will see that in the late language of the Gita and um, Hinduism in general, we will see, or 
Puranas, we will see this division of para and apara prakriti. Apara is the lower nature, para is the higher nature. This is that para apara prakriti, it is aditi and diti, yes, the mother. So there is the higher mother, the transcendental mother, para prakriti, and apara lower mother, and diti. So basically, um, you can see that they kind of come to the supermind, both of them, they cross here, their kind of domains, and the interaction on this level where the sacrifice is being generated, the whole manifestation is taking place. So the time and space are born on the level of Vijnana. So, and behind all of these, Behind them, there is someone, as the mother says, the supreme person, uh, Purushottama of the Gita. Mm -hmm. And that's why avatar sign is here in the supermind, yeah? holding both the transcendental and this world. So this is the major scheme of the Veda and the whole Hinduism. Now I've, I'm coming to the nitty of the system. I will uh, first present it and then we will have kind of, we will pause for questions. In, in case you have questions burning, you can always interrupt. I'm, I'm happy to, to answer questions on the fly. So we are now coming to these um, manifested worlds. So Surya Savitri, that transcendental uh, Vijnana Maya, the manifestation of the supermind, is manifested in terms of the rays of the sun. When the darkness pierces the body of the supermind, it generates the realm of the rays of the sun, which is called Svar world. Svar is light. Yeah? It has three luminous realms called Trirochana, three luminous realms, which thus project the higher three realms of the cosmic mind called Tisro Dialog, three heavens, yeah? sustaining the three spaces of the vital realm called Trini Rajansi or Tri Rajansi in Vedic language supported by three foundations of the physical called Tisrobhumi, three earths. This is the Vedic paradigm. So we have three realms of Svar, three heavens, three vital realms and three earths, altogether 12 realms, levels. If we look at them in this format, we can see that the triple supermind here, unity one in many and many in one and many, this is Daksha, Amsha and Surya, and, uh, project the three rochana of Svar, three realms, we will come to it, these are three realms of the overmind, and this uh, overmind projects three mental realms, these Rodiavach, three heavens, uh, which mother calls as mental mind, vital mind, and physical mind, three minds, three nirajansi, three um, levels of the vital, mental vital, vital vital, physical vital, and three realms of the physical, mental physical, vital physical, and physical physical. You can see three times three on this side of the world, and this is interesting because there is mental, vital, and physical. Yeah, heaven, space in between heaven and earth, and earth in a way. Or we have a head, torso, and legs of our being. Yeah? So these three levels of consciousness are also triple. Each of them has an element of the mind, element of the vital, and physical. All of them. And notice in the same hierarchy. And this hierarchy is repeated from the supermind. Mind, mind is more unifying, uh, vital is more diversifying, and physical is very diverse, yeah? uniquely 
and represented. So we can see the same happens in the mind, in the vital, in the physical. And these nine realms or nine um, rays, as they call them in the Veda, Navagva, nine rays, there is a name for the rishis. They are Navagva rishis, rishis of nine rays, who realized all the levels of consciousness. And they call to Indra to bring the 10th level. So Indra breaks through the head and brings the 10th connection and they become Dashagva Rishis, Rishis of 10 rays. So they connect to Svar world. This is from the Rig Veda. So if you look at this scheme, you will clearly see something interesting from the Tantra later also. This is the Vedic version. And it is also the vision of the integral yoga and later of the Tantra. So the Tantric vision will be that mental physical is the Kundalini Shakti or Muladhara Chakra from where Kundalini Shakti is rising. And it is rising to the Svadhisthana, to the Manipura, to the Anahata, and then finally to the Vishuddha, uh, Ajna, and Sahasrara. So we can see Sahasrara, uh, Ajna, Vishuddha, Anahata, uh, Manipura, and uh, Svadhisthana. And finally at the bottom of our torso and the beginning of the legs, there is this Manipura. Sorry, what do I say? Muladhara chakra. So this Muladhara is holding the ground and below, Mother says, below Muladhara there are two invisible chakras, two unknown chakras. One is on the level of the knees and that is vital physical and the other is below our feet, physical, physical, proper physical. Nobody uses these chakras because they are, the consciousness is very little there and we do not have the power of consciousness to reach down there. So we are aware only of our muladhara, yeah, which holds mula, yeah, the holder of the, our uh, mula, and mula goes deeper. So, and Mother says there are also three chakras above our Sahasrara, which are also rarely mentioned and not mentioned in the Tantric texts. And these are three rochanas. Yeah? There is intuition, there is the overmind chakra and supramental overmind. And we will, uh, so there are 12 levels, 12 levels of consciousness within embodied being. And then we come to the supermind and supermind is already transcendental to us. So if we look at Sri Aurobindo's terminology of these levels of the Svar world, supramental overmind, trirochanos, overmind, intuition, and mental overmind, and tisrodiyavak, three heavens of the mind, illumined mind, higher mind, and mind proper. And finally, of course, the three levels of the lower vital, so vital and physical, mental, vital, 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 physical, vital, mental, physical, vital, physical, physical, physical. He, she had been the calls them in the same way as mother. Mother brought this terminology from the Chaldean tradition, from the Semitic tradition, and she had been using it in the integral yoga also. So I'm coming back to the scheme and make a pause here for questions or some reflections. So please go ahead. I do not know how to stop. Shall I stop this? Stop sharing that I will see your faces at least. I hope it wasn't an overload uh, or it's totally alien language. What is he talking about? <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> I had a question. Yes. 
so you said these nine films uh, seek for the tenth one to come in. Can yeah. you elaborate a little more? What does the tenth one do? Right, I can. Yes, um, how they become the Shagvarishis? Mm. Uh, the Indra has to come in and there is Ayasya Rishi, the ancient secret Rishi who brings and invites Indra and Indra reaches out uh, through the ceiling of our Sahasrara because Sahasrara is the highest level yes, of our being, which is kind of the ceiling of our being. So to go beyond, to break through that ceiling is impossible for us from this side. So we need to invite Indra, the lord of the intuitive mind, to flash with the, his lightning, to crack our uh, ceiling from above and to bring the higher light into the action here, yeah, to illumine our being. So to connect these mm, Navagvas, uh, nine rays to the tenth, so to make it one with the transcendental light. And the difference is huge between the knowledge of the nine uh, rays and the tenth ray. A tenth ray is still pure in its knowledge, so to say, in its quality. The light is, uh, the, as it is said in the Veda, the Vajra of Indra is made with the light of the sun. So it is that pure supramental light is dawning on us and shows us everything, all the values we have here in the in the light of that supermind. Yeah? <laughs> so we perceive this in a totally different manner. So we see all that what is here embodied in the as as if it was a divine looking at it. Yeah? And that is a huge shift. We receive a, a, an insight, a knowledge which we can't have. So it is basically for the divinization of these nine realms, we seek the help of the Indra. Yes, that our consciousness is joining both, yes holding nine and adds the tenth and of course eleventh and twelfth are automatically there because Indra is nothing but the action of those three realms. Three regions. So that's why they don't even speak about twelve, they speak about ten. Ten is already, tenth is already the breakthrough to, the, to another the domain. And uh, yes, uh, there are many things. Uh, there is a beautiful passage which I would recommend if you want to know more about the difference between this view of this uh, of the Svar world, uh, Indra's vision, and uh, our mental knowledge, the highest mental knowledge we can have. It is in the self of the mind. There is a canto in Shirobindo Savitri where he describes exactly this. And if you read it, you will have total understanding of the difference. <laughs> it's amazing how beautifully he describes that. There's somebody's hand is here. Yeah, Mahesh. Um, my question is about Vivaswan, and you mentioned that there's a secret of the Veda sitting there. And in a sense, as I heard you speak, it felt as though Aditi abandoned Vivaswan. Uh, but an abandonment by Aditi does not put him into the realm of Diti, does it? And well, it's a symbolic language, yes, abandoning, leaving alone, separating. So the transcendental world was separated from this world. Uh, there is a kind of, yeah, it's not the same anymore. There is it, there is another language of later kind that he cast out of himself, srijati, from his sarga. Srij is to cast out, yeah? 
So what does it mean casting out? Where out if everywhere is the divine? Yeah. So the same here, she left or cast out. There was a gap created between the transcendental and this world in consciousness. Yeah? So the world in time and space is different from the world beyond time and space, as it were. So how else would we speak about these things? Yeah. We need some mythological symbolic language to indicate this process, which we may understand with our mind, which is already embodied here in this time and space. So, yes, Vivasvat is interesting from another point of view because Lucifer in the Chaldean tradition is also that creator of the world <laughs> and also the same name lucifer luminous one yeah though he is in the darkness he is luminous and um, shobindo actually the whole secret of the veda why this word secret of the veda because the secret is that within the darkness there is a hidden light which holds the darkness which descended into the darkness to support the process of redemption and return to its origin of, of fallen emanations. There were two stages of creation. Yeah? First is casting out so that the darkness was created. So not the light was created, but the darkness. In the Bible it was God said, let it be light. In the weather, God said, let it be darkness. <laughs> because he is light. <laughs> so, and then he entered into that darkness. And from that darkness, the process of evolution started. What we have in our midst, we represent both the fallen emanations, unconscious being in our body, and something in us which is totally conscious, eh? the soul. So, and in between the most conscious and the most unconscious, there is a whole range of relations. So we are the double creation. Eh? We are the sparks of that fire which is rising from Vivasmat as souls. So there's more and more and more to it. Once one start reading the Rig Veda, it, it really gives you so much insight and understanding of how things are in the spiritual and material sense, because they do not separate one from the other. You know, for them, the matter, the material manifestation is manifestation of that darkness and unconsciousness, which is becoming more and more conscious in the evolutionary process. We are slowly growing into this awareness. We build more and more suitable instruments for knowledge. Yes, our body is evolving, becoming more and more subtle, more receptive of the spirit. Yeah, look how how slowly we developed over, over billions of years from monocellular organism, which didn't have any uh, in, you know, organs of neither eyes, nor hands, nor legs, but it wanted to communicate, it wanted to express itself, so all the faculties were packed there in that cell, and then it started to evolve, to multiply itself, to join into clusters with others, building more and more, slowly building the instruments, the legs, the eyes, the brain, the nervous system, the ears, so and the tongue to express oneself, the speech came through. So this physical body was evolving the instruments slowly until the, we now we can sit in, uh, I sit in US, you in India, <laughs> and we communicate over some electrical signals. <laughs> Mm, this is a great achievement of the spirit yeah, in the physical sense. So the, the, the Vedas are seeing this um, evolution of consciousness or evolution of the species, let us say, of the body 
as the enterprise of the spirit. They don't see it as it evolves by itself, some Darwinian evolution, and then suddenly we get some, you know, social consciousness, which is rather the, uh, you know, phenomenon which appeared uh, by itself. No, it's not like that. <laughs> the consciousness was there demanding the instrument, and that instrument came into being slowly. And it will go on. Shubhendra says uh, the human being, the man, is a transitional being. It's not the end of the evolution. The, the demand of consciousness will grow. And we will grow into the supramental beings. And beyond. There is no end to this evolution. This is the beauty of the, of course, of the integral yoga. There's some somebody else here. Yeah. Uh, so there is a there is a question in the chat from Chitra. Uh, what does one mean by mental mind, vital mind, and physical mind, or mental physical? Sorry, mental mind, mental vital, and mental physical. Do these refer to the locations of the mind that are aware of the mental, vital, and physical? Are, are there no locations in the mind that bring them together? Well, uh, I, truly speaking, um, the, the mixing of the levels, yes. So there is mental level. So if you look at our body simply, yeah, you will see that our body has three parts. Yeah? There is the head part, there is a torso part, yeah? If you look at the even uh, Purusha Sukta, you will see the Brahmin is the mouth, the word, the Rajanya or the Kshatriya is the shoulders and the hands, you know, the arms. Uh, the productory organ, the torso and production is Vaishya and legs are Shudra. So these are the four major powers of Purusha, of universal Purusha. We are all Chaturvarnya. Every man is Chaturvarnya. Hmm? Embodies all powers of the spirit, from the power of knowledge, power of action, power of joy and reproduction, and power of service or perfection in action. Hmm? So all of them have to become our own powers. Uh, and um, uh, I was heading to this. So if you look at our head, head is more this triple mind, the torso is triple vital. Yeah? It's amazing. We have the heart, we have all the feelings, plexus solaris, yes, all this dantian center, what we call that, uh, this uh, Swadhishthana, where all the nadis, 72,000 nadis come together and build the senses in the physical body. And then we have Muladhara, the top of the legs, which is going down to the legs. So we have legs, torso, and the head, and all of them are triple. There is the physical, uh, the Vishuddha is the expression of the mind in the physical form is speech. Yeah? When we speak, we manifest the mind yeah? in the physical world, in time and space. Uh, in the this uh, Ajna chakra is the chakra of the third eye. It's the mind uh, of the will power or the mind of the vital power or life mind of the universal life mind, which is being the, associated with this third eye of uh, Shiva or Ajna chakra. And then there is Sahasrara, thousand. Um, rays the lotus on the top when it opens like a crown, yeah? uh, which is mental mind or the self of mind. So we have three minds in the head, three uh, interestingly centers in the middle, that is Anahata, which is more the center of the emotions rather than feelings because emotions are the feelings which are painted over with the mental concepts 
of aesthetics and beauty and we recognize emotions are higher than feelings. Feelings and impulses are more basic, yeah? um, kind of dynamism of the life force, which is not yet um, kind of made beautiful by the mind, so to say. So if you make impulses in more beautiful, they become emotions. You can describe them, emotion of love and so on. But the vital has this Manipura. Uh, Manipura is that actually the center of the fire, uh, the crack. It is navel center. Interestingly, navel also connects us to the in the womb when we live, we are fed through the navel, through this crack. There is a connection of the fetus to the uh, of the garbha uh, into the to the mother. Yeah? We are fed through it, and then when we are born, that navel is cut, yeah? so we are separated from the mother. But we have another navel which is coming subtle world, which is connects our vital body to the physical. And when that navel, that string is cut, we are dying. Yeah? So that it's very interesting. When we exteriorize, when we come out of the physical body in the vital body, many people know that there is a connection, subtle connection, and we we call it navel, yeah? because it comes from the navel. It connects to the so navel continues in the subtle world, in the vital world. And that string you should not cut, because if you cut that string, you are dead. You can't come back to the physical body. So you go with your vital away. So again, navel, you see navel is so important. And that is the crack between the worlds. Through that crack, we pass, we go into the other worlds. We can go into the upper worlds or into the lower, into the superconscient or into the inconscient. Through that crack, all the forces enter. Maybe in the second half of my presentation, I will show you the crack and you will recognize it. I have, I made pictures with my drawings to show you where everything goes into this crack. So we are like heaven and earth, upper and lower hemisphere, mental and physical consciousness, and in between this crack to which all other forces can enter. And within us, there is a constant battlefield between these two armies of light and darkness. <laughs> and we are in between that, in, in the middle of that battle, we have to decide to whom to give preference. You know this. It's a constant life. It's a life what we live. You know? Constant inner dialogue. Uh, to whom to give preference? To this, to, uh, to selfishness, and uh, or to uh, to to be, to do the sacrifice, to do the good, or to do something which is more uh, suitable to you, adv adventurous for yourself. And this is ongoing, ongoing fight. And who wins? Eh, it's a matter of, of your choice, actually. As Shobindo says, they are fighting as these two armies are fighting for our soul as the costly prize. <laughs> they want to win our soul because who wins our soul, he dominates in this manifestation. Yeah? So there are forces of darkness who want to possess the manifestation and the forces of light, which are also here fighting the forces of darkness. This is the Vedic vision of the Sacrifice. Sacrifice is a constant battle, hmm? ongoing battle. And the uh, Rishis describe it uh, as a battle. And they ask Indra, they ask Agni to devour these Rakshasas, these low Paishachas, uh, and so on. There are many names to these godheads and these lower godheads, Piprus. Uh, Shushnas, uh, 
all kinds of creatures, Rakshasas, Paishachas, Daityas, Dasyus, Danavas, uh, lists of names of these darker beings which are constantly trying to influence us one way or another. And we know this because it is our life. <laughs> And no through problem. us, they have exchange with the world. Yeah. Through us, they actually possess the energies of the world and steal our higher light and hide it in the subconscious cave and now hold it there until we come with Indra's lightning and break that vala, that uh, subconscious cave and release our, our treasures of a spiritual perception. This is the language which uh, the Veda is using to describe these uh, processes, psychological processes, which are very difficult to describe otherwise. Now I made an overload, I know, but I will come to the second half and you will see it better. Yeah. Uh, Alok has a question. Yes, sir. Hello. Yeah, I have got two questions. One is, uh, what is the language of the Vedas? It was, uh, in what language they were able to express all these experiences and uh, how it is uh, no, uh, remaining in that purity? And the second question is, uh, these 12 uh, centers of consciousness, uh, looking at what attributes can we identify that consciousness is in that? Yes, of course we can. Yes, and that's the whole integral yoga psychology is dealing with these. How to identify on what level what is happening to us. Yeah? What is mental mind? By the way, I would recommend you to read Sri Aurobindo Savitri and especially this the self of mind if you want to see the difference between one uh, level of consciousness and the other very drastically different and you will see you will learn something which you can't we can't learn otherwise because we don't have that experience yeah, yet but once we read it we we are tuning to the more mm, subtle perception of things and then more things open up to us. So we are all learning. We are here kind of packed in our own physical, mental consciousness, you know, and uh, overloaded with dogmas and ideas from the society and so on. And for whatever we learned from the books. But um, truly speaking, the world is much more complex. Regarding the the language, it's important, it's an important question actually, what language do the Vedic Rishis use? Uh, it is amazing, but they are using the language, of course it is Sanskrit, Vedic Sanskrit, yes, ancient Vedic Sanskrit, which is very rich, much richer than um, classical Sanskrit, yes, has many more forms, forms which classical Sanskrit does not allow, prohibits altogether. Um, yeah. Uh, for example, I, g I can give you many examples. Yeah. So uh, such forms as uh, you cannot use, um, you cannot use in imperatives, uh, uh, for example, forms of the future basis, like Bhavishya tu, you cannot use. Yeah? Or, uh, you can, uh, and these forms are found also in uh, in epic Sanskrit, in even in Mahabharata. So it was much more flexible language, 
uh, you could take any basis and use through all the Sarvadhatuka forms, those who know Sanskrit, I'm speaking to them. So all four Sarvadhatuka forms, starting from uh, Lat Lang, Lot Vidhiling, you can put into uh, aorist form, you can use the reduplicative perfect in all these forms and so on. So it gives a variety of senses which which is classical Sanskrit prohibits, and a, and even more, a, each of the hymns, especially we study hymns to the Mystic Fire, and other hymns. Um, I did uh, the study of more than four hundred hymns of the Rig Veda thorough study, and it is in each hymn you will find one or two words which are met only in this hymn. Never after, never before, definitely, and never after. So only once, only in this hymn. So what can you do then? Yeah. So you have to know very deeply, very, very profoundly Sanskrit uh, grammar, understand Sanskrit etymology, how the Vedic rishis were building words. And then you will see that the language itself was the way to know. So there is no guru uh, we, who will tell you how it is. Uh, guru is the hymn, yeah. language. Language of the hymn is the guru. As, as Rishi says, I build this hymn as carpenter builds the chariot to rise to heaven in consciousness. So this chariot will bring you to heaven. So once you have this hymn with you, but you have to really dwell on it and understand what Rishi is saying. So dwelling on it, understanding it etymologically, understanding it psychologically and so on, not being in a hurry to read it through and that's it. It's not going to work, but really kind of staying with the mantra until you come close and close and close. It's like veil upon veil is removed. Yeah. And then and then boom, you can see. You can see really what he wants to say. Everything, all the elements come together. It's a very uh, powerful uh, um, composition, the Veda, which is really working upon our consciousness which can transform and change our consciousness. And that's why um, in the Indian tradition, they preserved this as the most precious thing. Yeah? The thousands of generations of Brahmin gave their lives to just record by memory the text and pass it to the future. Why? Because it was the most precious thing. Yeah? It was considered to be the, um, the, as Mother says, the Vedic Rishis are not even evolutionary beings. They are involutionary beings. Those who brought the higher knowledge down to earth, to human beings, to remember. They, it's like a record of the group soul, yes? At the beginning of each Manvantara, the group of Rishis come down with the knowledge of the Veda and give it to humanity. So the humanity should have a, a memory of the plan of the group soul, why we are here for, what we are here for, for this Manvantara. It's a plan of the group soul. So it's a memory, it's a deep, fundamental, psychic memory of the group soul. <laughs> what is to be done? What is to be achieved? And that's why Sri says, uh, everything what we had in the Veda, uh, we will have in the Veda in the future. So to say, there is nothing extra. Everything is there already in the form of the plan of vision. And that vision has to be understood. And if you look at the Indian tradition, you will see that all the commentaries, Brahmanas, Aranyakas, Upanishads, Gita, Puranas, are nothing but unfolding of this vision. In different languages, in different structures of consciousness already, different stories, development of this one particular vision, 
why we are here for, what we are here for. So what we are here for to do, and that is the sacrifice. We are here to transform this nature through ourselves. We are these stations of transformation. We invoke higher powers of consciousness to act upon these lower ones and transform them, make them more and more receptive of the higher consciousness. It makes sense. It's a very fundamental, very archetypal vision for every culture, for every religion, doesn't matter in which religion you are or what names you give to the gods, uh, still you will be doing the same thing. You will be invoking higher powers, subtle powers to come to this gross matter and to make it more supple, more receptive. This is what is going on. Until this matter becomes totally open to the spirit and can manifest the spirit in full uh, in time and space. So the idea which uh, the Vedas are speaking is that why this creation was uh, made is because he wanted to be many. Uh, the one who is <laughs> wanted to be many. Bahus Yam, may I be many. So how one who alone is could become many? This is a question. Huh? How could you do it? We are all parts of this one you know, who alone is. But we are already perceiving ourselves as separate. And I look at you, you are me. Yeah, and he, I am you, but we do not know that. So there is a gap and that gap is creating or generating a lot of interesting activities within himself. As Mother describes this, she says he has himself in his supreme identity, but he wanted to experience himself in unity. Now, unity implies the diversity, that you know, separation, and that's why that casting or separating is introduced, that night was created. That is the gap which allows him to deal with himself in bits and pieces, in details. So, and these details can relate to each other in unique relations and generate, as Mother says, the additional Ananda. <laughs> he wanted more Ananda. <laughs> so Ananda of identity was not enough for him. He wanted to generate Ananda of unity. Yeah, it makes sense. This is the only reason why this creation came into being, for more Ananda. You, do you want to continue with the session or there is right. yes yes sure i'm just making a pause otherwise a little gap um, so tarika asks does the evolution in the supramental consciousness coincide with the end of kali yuga I think so. Kali Yuga, in this case, uh, Mother says that there will be no pralaya in this Manvantara. And it's interesting that in Indian tradition also, the next Manvantara of Vaivasvata, we are in Vaivasvata Manvantara, that very Vivasvat, yeah, that Lord of the Sun. And um, next will be Savarna. Uh, and this is interesting that we are in the middle, yeah, in the seventh Manvantara, in the eighth or seventh, so we are moving to the eighth. We are exactly in the middle. There are 14 Manvantaras in each Kalpa. So the next will be 
Savarna and next, 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 each one will be Savarna, 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 Savarna. So there is no distinction between the Manvantaras afterwards. It's amazing. They Each Manvantara has a specific name, specific action, but till the middle, from the middle onwards, the pralaya will not take place. There will be transition. There will be no forgetting of what was done and starting again from zero, you know, involving the group soul. So um, this uh, this implies this vision of the supramental uh, joining the Kali Yuga. Kali Yuga will end up uh, with Satya Yuga transition to Satya Yuga anyway. If we speak Indian language, yes, Pokal Yugas. And I want us also to understand that these are languages or these are the fingers pointing to the real thing. Yeah? So you should not take them too serious. Yeah? These are the ways to speak about it. Yeah? When we say Kali Yuga, Satya Yuga, these are indicators not things in themselves. Indicators of certain processes. It's much richer behind than the indication can do. Hmm. Yep. Some, uh, some, somebody else, yeah? Uh, Sirisha. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Vladimir, yes. uh, 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 first of all, thank you uh, for that, um, uh, the video where you spoke about uh, Om Agni Le Purohitam with, uh, uh, for aspiration with Natalia. It's so beautiful. It, it's always like resonating in my heart. The verse, I don't even know Sanskrit. So the verse, so I have a question. Is that verse a living form? Because I tend to feel it very strongly. The, the Rig Veda first verse that you sang in the aspiration video. Like oh, Om. Oh, I, aspiration, yes. Oh, now I finally understood. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, just like Om is a very truly living form for me, is these verses to have that living sense? Right. Uh, you see, interesting about Om. Quite interesting thing to know. Mm. It's of course it's uh, something which was discovered by the Vedic rishis. The powerful sound, his mother says, this sound is sounding in the universe constantly. Yes, supporting the universe. If you listen carefully. You would hear oh, the whole universe is doing Om. Yeah. So mm, when she heard, the mother heard first time this Om sound, she, mm, she heard it in Paris. Somebody did it there in the, in the uh, meeting, uh, was talking about Indian philosophy and did this Om. And when he did this, she saw that the whole uh, hall became lighter. It was like illumined by just the very sound. No, but of course, ma the mother has her own deeper perception of things, but still, it's a, an amazing perception that suddenly everything was lightened up with just one sound. Oh. And for her, it was kind of a, a, a revelation that this sound has such a great power. Mm. Of course, it has a power. And it also it acquired it from the tradition because each one who pronounces Om tries to go deeper and it builds up on it, you know, gives energy to, to this idea sound. That's why every time you pronounce it, it is there. It is kind of connecting you to the whole many thousands generations tradition. <laughs> And you are becoming part of it, of that egregor, of that chain of power, spiritual power. Beyond that, that it is it by itself is the sound which supports the universe. Uh, regarding the 
uh, aspiration and uh, Agni Mile. The first hymn of the Rig Veda is uh, profound in one way because it covers within itself. We spoke about this in in this forum in IPI already, and not once most probably on the first hymn of the Rig Veda. The first and the last hymn of the Rig Veda are very important. The first is the beginning, the whole vision of the sacrifice. And the, sec the last one is the message to humanity. And if you look at these two hymns, it will give you a very good sense of what Rig Veda is about. Yeah? So in the first hymn, we it starts with Agnim Ile. I, as Shubindo translates, seek the divine flame with adoration. Uh, Ile I, is I adore literally, but Shubindo translates it's not just adore, it's seeks with adoration. I seek with adoration the divine flame. And this divine flame is, according to Shirobendo, the divine will in us, aspiration, will, the divine will. And we most probably we had um, before the session on Agni, that Agni is viewed in two different formations. Yes, as Agni has the flame in the heart as a psychic being, and there is the flame in nature, which is the heat in nature, which is universal Agni pushing everything forward in its development. It is that evolutionary force. So one is called Yajatra, other is called Idya or Priya. So the Vedic Rishis approach Agni in two different forms. Yajatra, worthy of sacrifice, that means that which is constantly transforming our nature, yeah, from within, pushing it forward, Darwinian evolution, yeah, survival of the fittest, if you will. And the other is the flame in the heart, the love towards the divine, Priya or Idiya, beloved one, or sought with adoration. And that is more individualized flame. It is that flame of the psychic being. And two flames create the whole movement forward. It is one and the same flame. And but viewed in two different positions. Uh, I have one more question, if it's OK. Um, yes, please. Are our sounds like like a physical chair? Are sounds like that? That's my question. Makes sense. <laughs> uh, it, sounds as a physical chair. Yeah, th there is a sound. You uh, and there's a chair. As you physically feel it, the sound also is there, sitting there or physically vibrating there. Does it make sense? Can you explain a little more that I should know? Okay, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a video playing and you stop it and, and there's no sound. But you still hear the sound, the, the sense of that sound. Like the, the sound is physically there. Even though it's stopped, the sound is physically there in that space. Even though the recording of it is done or or just like mother's music it played for a while and it stopped but the the vibration of it is physically there and some some days you feel it of course it is uh, you feel it physically not even Absolutely. just the mother's music like uh, my daughter playing some music for a while and it stopped and it's physically there <laughs> okay. Absolutely. By the way, uh, what you are saying is uh, important to view on on everything, on the sound, on the mantra, on poetry and music. Uh, the best musicians play in such a way that they they generate this space of silence within which you can actually accept the sound and it can be kept there. You know, so to say, before you start playing, 
you have to create that perception because what is silence? Silence is a deep perception of the sound, yes? Mm, so there is no yet vibration, but you already expect it. You are looking for it, you are waiting for it, and then it starts and you appreciate the difference, how it enters into this, what it represents by itself. And if you can keep that sense of silence or space throughout the music, you, li you listen very carefully. And at the end, when music is over, that silence has to, to hold it, embrace it, like Varuna yeah, in his embrace. And when this happens, then you can appreciate music. I, I dislike when people clap immediately after music is finished. It, it really hits me so strongly. I think, couldn't you wait a little that it would settle, that I could keep it? Yeah, they break with this clapping so easily. The perception of that beauty. So beautiful. Thank you, Vladimir. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, and with this, uh, of course, mantra, uh, so I adore or I seek with the duration of the divine flame, the one put in front of our journey, Purohitam, the God or the luminous being of our transformation, Yajnasya Devam, Ritvijam, the one who makes all the transformation in accordance with time and space, in Ritu, in the seasons, Ritu Ij, yes? It's a Ritvik, the one who sacrifices according to the seasons. He knows the order in time, what is to be transformed first, what is next. Hotaram, the one who invokes the summoner of all the powers to their action. He brings down all the greater powers for their activities within our consciousness. Ratnadhatamam, the one who bestows the greatest wealth and riches. And these wealth and riches are the spiritual riches, yeah? the riches of transformation. So you can hear in one line the whole vision of the Veda. <laughs> he does everything. He is leading us forward. He is the leader forward. By the way, Agni, uh, Agre Nayati Agni, he says Yaska in uh, Nirukta. Agni is the one who leads forward, most probably from root Ag to move forward, or Aj to lead forward, Ajati. From here, Aja, he has a vehicle, uh, Vahana of uh, goat. Goat, Aja, or unborn one, is the leader forward. You know, Aja is always forward moving, interestingly. So this leader forward, driving forward force, it is him, he is the engine of all evolution, says Purohitam, leading us in front. He is the leader of our journey. He is the most luminous God of transformation. He is the one who knows how to do it in time and space. He invokes and brings down all the powers of divine consciousness and bestows upon us the greatest wealth and riches. So what else can you say about Agni? <laughs> In one line, the whole vision of Agni. And of course, it co goes on and on. I somewhere, I published uh, 28 hymns of uh, book five, and I made at the end the uh, the vocabulary, the dictionary of all the epithets of Agni. And I think it was like uh, 15 or 16 pages, only epithets of Agni, how they name and call Agni in 28 hymns. <laughs> you would not believe how rich it is. You just read through those epithets, epithets and you would be enlightened because how they call him, with what love, with what understanding. So these, these are epithets, Porohit, the one who is put Porohita in front, Yajnas Yadeva, the, the Lord of our transformation, sacrifice, uh, Ritvik, these are the names of Agni, Hotar, 
but are the one who invokes the Godheads and whom who offers. He is the offerer and the in summoner of the gods. And this is interesting because we, when we summon higher powers, we don't summon them for nothing, yes? We offer something. We have something to offer. Offering is calling. We don't call person, come here, give me. Yeah? No, we call, come here, have it. Yeah. So we have something to offer. That's why we call. So we invoke always to give, not to take. Nowadays, most probably it's also both ways. <laughs> come here, give me. <laughs> But in the uh, Satya Yuga or other previous Yugas or Indian tradition, it was always you invoke or call somebody if you have something to give. And it is still so, yes, in Indian tradition. So invoking and offering is the same root, who? Juhoti. It's amazing, yeah? Havayati and Juhoti in two different classes, and Hotar, Shivbindo translates as summoner of the gods and the one who offers also. So offering and summoning. So both ways. No? Otherwise, how? And Agni is also the one who sacrifices here the gods in another hymn. You know, root yaj is interesting. Yajna itself is an amazing thing. He, the divine will, sacrifices here the gods. The gods are being sacrificed. They don't want to come here down. They don't want to come into this darkness of our uh, ignorance and you know stupidity and incapacity and so on and suffering. But he calls them, he commands them, and he forces them to come down. And once they come down, they start changing our perception, they widen our scope of uh, capacity. Of um, So basically, they start working here when they are coming down, but they don't want. Yeah. And there is uh, uh, an interesting description by the mother that the gods really resist. They don't want to go into the darkness of our existence. But there is a flame within, this flame, this spark of Agni, that psychic being which loves, which seeks the divine flame with adoration, <laughs> with love. And that energy brings down those higher powers into action. So they are being sacrificed. Interesting. This is something which we don't find, this explanation we don't find anywhere, that the gods are being sacrificed here. But they are, and Mother dis describes the sacrifice in this exactly this way, that uh, the Divine Mother actually comes down into the darkness. Shubindo calls it the Holocaust of the Divine Mother, though it is known as sacrifice of Purusha. Universal Purusha was sacrificed here. All the faculties of the Universal Purusha you know, his mouth broke forth, his nostrils, his eyes, his ears broke forth. They all plunged all his faculties into the darkness of the inconscient ocean. So this is the sacrifice of the Purusha, of these devatas, yeah, who were brought down to build up from within the in divine being. So they are constantly brought down and made here to work for our progress. And they have something interesting, they have a hook. Why they are actually agreeing to come down, they may, because it is the divine will which is commanding them, but also um, because when they come down to this sacrifice, they get an opportunity to grow themselves and to change. The divine powers 
who in themselves consider themselves to be perfect in a way, like Indra, all the godheads, even the greatest godheads, when they come down to our call and start working here, changing our nature, they get an opportunity to change themselves and to overgrow their capacity. They rise to the level, as in the Veda it is said, to the throne from which they see both Aditi and Diti. And that look, that view on Aditi and Diti both, on that transcendental and this consciousness, is given only to the divine. So they gain that divine vision. They gain that divine status which they don't have yet. Without the sacrifice, they cannot get it. And that is the hook which is bringing them down to work here, because they will also grow in their consciousness. I have a question uh, uh, just to like when you get any mantra, uh, how do you deal with these mantras? Like, uh, how do you approach them? How do you hold them? Yeah, first uh, we need to know the language. Yeah? It's not enough to know the mantra and not enough, enough to know approximately the meaning. Yeah, it kind of, I guess, the meaning is like this. We know, Agni Mile, Purohitam, we know that. Yeah. It's not enough. You have to really go deeper into each word, etymologically, you have to dwell on the meaning. Why uh, Rishi is choosing this or that? So to say, Simple analysis will help at the beginning, and then it's it becomes a contemplation. You have a question. Each hymn has a very specific way of triggering interest in you. There will be some kind of misplacement which will make you think. It's amazing. Uh, for example, second first is Agni Mile Purohitam is easy, yeah? but the second one. Agni mile porohitam, yajnyas yadevam, ritvijam hotaram, ratnatatam, agnif purve bih, rishi bih, idi yonutanayruta sa devan e havakshati. So, agnif purve bih, rishi bih, idiyah. So, agni is to be adored by the previous rishis and by the modern ones. It's already a what? What? Wait a minute. Oh, how he should be adored by the previous riches? They are already gone in time. And it seems they are not. <laughs> they are still there, the Purva Rishaya. They are all, as Shibindu says, always there, waiting to assist our journey. And the moment we start our journey, they will assist it. They will come with the help. Yeah. This is what is happening uh, with the hymns. Once you start reading it with meaning for yourself, you will feel the support, you will feel the widening of consciousness. These are not just simple kind of verses or poetry. It's a very functional, as Shubhendu says, Vedic Rishis composed uh, hymns in the most utilitarian, with the most utilitarian purpose, to assist our journey. It is not for the sake of beauty of the mantra or poetry. It has that utilitarian aim to, to make a, the change, the shift of consciousness possible. And it, it works. Once you start doing it, it really works. I actually can invite you to our uh, Hymns to the Mystic Fire. We have a big group from India. We are meeting on Fridays, I think nine o'clock our time, so it will be evening your time, which will be okay for you, I guess, like 6.30 in the evening Indian time. And there are many Indian people there, 
from Calcutta, from IIT Calcutta, and so on. So you could um, you could see for yourself how we dwell on hymns verse by verse. We don't go more than three verses in an hour. Yeah, we stay with them until it is becoming totally clear for us, or totally uh, relatively clear. But you will have a sense of it. You will have a sense of what. Uh, so it will reappear in you as consciousness. You will get some a new perception of the world and yourself. It's kind of a widening of consciousness. And very, very blissful and pleasant and peaceful. And you want to keep it always and to carry it forward. No. Oh, there are a few here. There is Deepti here from this, uh, from our studies. Yes, Deepti, you are here. Uh, yeah, Vladimir. Every time I hear you, it's like something lights up. It has to pile up. It piles up, it grows, grows, and it's more and more and more. And it is uh, something interesting happens with time if we are really concentrating. This effort has to be, you know, gathered, concentrated, held, uh, accumulated. It is not enough to think about it once in a while. It needs uh, attention, it needs concentration, tapasya of some kind. And it grows uh, into some kind of new consciousness which we I, many times I feel I don't deserve this. What what the grace is this? You know how calm that it exists and it is there for you. Who are you really to have this? You know this big thing, uh, which makes you happy on the spot. You don't need any other happiness anymore. Everything else looks like a very uh, like painful <laughs> enjoyment in comparison to this happiness. <laughs> yeah, without this life makes no sense. So it needs to become part of our life. It is the purpose why we are here. The, the faster we become aware of it, the better it is for all of us. So uh, I have another, of course, part of this presentation, but most probably since we are talking, I love to talk more. Uh, questions and answers is better than just presentations. I will send you the PowerPoint presentation. You will see for yourself what it is and how it works. But this vision of the triple worlds is actually telling us that the physical world is interwoven into the spiritual. Physical is a part of the supramental creation. Yeah. If you look at the physical, let me project again. If you look at this physical physical, yeah, you will see that there is nothing in this world same in the physical world. Yeah. No same substance occupies the same space and time. So everything here is in full diversity. Yes, so you will never find the same, I don't know, leaves on the trees. Yeah, There is never the same leaf. Uh, there is always some difference. There is never the same fingerprint or pebble on the shore. Can you imagine pebbles on the shore? The whole you, you know, kind of earth ocean, you go through all the, the shores and you will not find the same pebble. They will be all different, infinitely different. So in the physical world, everything is infinitely different. And that infinity is coming from the supermind, from this many. Nothing is the same. But on the vital level, things are being diversified, one in many, in many, in one. It is on the vital level that that uniqueness of the physical is being formulated. 
or formed, yeah? shaped. And mantle is more unifying element. It's more conceptual, conceptual pebble, conceptual leaf, conceptual fingerprint. This is the concept of anything which will be diversified. And you can see the same idea yeah? of unity, one in many in many in one in many of the supermind is projected into this world. So you can see that the physical is nothing but the manifestation of the supramental. So there is no physical away from the spirit. It is, physical is a spiritual thing. This is what I want us to understand. Once we understand this, there will be never ever again a problem. Physical is spiritual manifestation. Amazing, yeah? We always thought that physical is separate from the spirit. Spirit is there, physical is Maya, illusion. We have to leave it, we have to drop it. It's a painful thing, it's a disease, death, uh, incapacity, pain. So everything has, it's like an imprisonment of the soul and we have to get out of here and disappear somewhere in the spirit. But then the Vedic vision is totally different. The spirit is to be manifested here in time and space, in all the infinite varieties, infinite relations. That's why in the Veda there is no mukti concept whatsoever. No mukti. There is nobody to be mukta. <laughs> the involutionary beings, the rishis, are the avatars. They brought the spirit down to matter. They want to transform our nature. They want to make it divine. And that's how Sri Aurobindo is writing his life divine. That life itself is to become divine. And that's why we are here for. We are here for not to run from this, you know, difficulty of being here. We are here to bring more and more the divine presence into every activity, into our thoughts, into our feelings, into our actions, constantly connecting to the divine and letting it work upon us and upon our world. And this is a very beautiful ideal of the Veda and Integral Yoga. Most complete, including all, denying none. Everything has to find its divine place in this world. Everything is to work in the divine way. Only we mixed up things. And that is adharma, when we mix them up in time and space. How to find its, for everything, its proper time and proper space. We cannot do it by ourselves. We need the divine help. As Shubhendra says, we need only to invoke the divine and the divine will do all the work. We have to become faithful instruments of the divine. Surrender was his only strength. This is the line from Savage. Great. Okay, we can uh, stop here, I guess. Two hours flew like nothing. <laughs> Thank you for being with uh, Rig Veda. This is a very special literature. It is something which India offers to the world. This is the grand gift to the world, which world is still to discover. In India also has to discover and start practicing it. Thank you very much, Madhavi.